Hello, welcome to this quick session for Year 13 before your A-level exams on tectonic hazards and process and your knowledge gaps. So we're going to look at earthquake hazards, which are primary and secondary, volcanic hazards, which are primary and secondary as well, predicting earthquakes, volcanoes and tsunamis, the power model, the hazard management cycle and disaster modification, including management of disasters. So the first thing to look at is hazards caused by earthquakes. Now these are P waves, S waves and L waves, which are types of waves that cause the damage from earthquakes. Primary waves are fastest, they cause the least damage, they have the least energy and they cause compression on the landscape. Secondary waves are much more violent, they cause violent shaking and they arrive after P waves. They are one of the most damaging and L waves are very damaging as well. So L waves arrive last, they only travel on the surface horizontally and they can cause significant damage including structural uh, damage like crustal fracturing. Now crustal fracturing is a primary impact of earthquakes and this looks like buckling on the landscape. It deforms the landscape itself. It fractures the landscape and can open deep gaps in the landscape. And that has been seen in large earthquakes such as the Indian Ocean earthquake and tsunami of 2004, which caused a fault line to open of a thousand kilometers long. And crustal fracturing also can cause then liquefaction, which is secondary to that. And liquefaction is effectively when water underneath the surface of the earth is forced upward with loose sediment. That can cause flooding, damage to foundations and buildings, the sinking of buildings, the tilt and collapse of them as well. And finally, the last secondary hazard from earthquakes is landslides. Of course, landslides are caused by the loosening geology and soil of a hilly area particularly. And what that does is it causes the dislodgement of all of that material downhill. An example of this is the Sichuan earthquake of 2008. Uh, in Asia, which caused 30% um, of deaths in that event was actually due to landslides and not the earthquake itself, was due to that secondary hazard. In terms of volcanoes, there are a number of primary and secondary general impacts as a result of a volcanic event. Pyroclastic flow, for example, is large, dense clouds of hot ash going down a mountainside or a vol volcano side mainly composite volcanoes, very hot, 600 degrees Celsius, very fast, a couple of hundred miles per hour. And they can devastate whole areas. Ashfall, of course, mainly again in composite volcanoes whereby ash is thrown into the air, ash particles, tephra, and that kills vegetation over time on the ground surface. The weight of the ash on buildings can collapse them and it can also get into water sources, poisoning people who drink it and the water source itself. Lava flows, of course, is when there's extensive areas of lava flowing down a hillside or a volcanic side. And lava flows can wipe out anything in their path because of the heat with which they flow. Gas eruptions. The key thing with gas eruptions is the gases that are being erupted into the atmosphere. So carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, that poisons people and potentially animals in extreme cases. And then we have some secondary impacts and they include lahars. And they are effectively volcanic mud flows and they occur when rainfall basically mobilizes the volcanic ash so it turns it into this sludgy mud which travels down in rivers at high speeds and finally we have yokel holbs and these are mainly seen in iceland another secondary impact whereby we have an ice cap or ice that is on top of a erupting volcano which melts that ice and causes flooding down hit the hillside and down river streams and so on so let's move on now to predicting earthquakes and volcanoes and tsunamis. Now earthquakes are very difficult to be predicted. In fact, they cannot really be predicted, even with scientific research. What we can do, however, is identify high risk areas using risk forecasting. Areas that are likely to suffer from severe earthquakes due to their plate tectonic activity. And we can use this then to land zone, to future proof where people live, to reduce the impacts overall. What we can also look at is what are called seismic gaps, which is effectively a gap in years 
since an earthquake has been experienced and places can become overdue and are therefore seen as high risk. So as we've said already, it's very difficult to predict earthquakes. What we can do is we can use seismometers and sensors in the sea to see what the energy waves are doing. So when there are smaller earthquakes, such as a one or two magnitude earthquake, that can then help us to predict that a bigger earthquake may be imminent. But just to say again, these don't actually predict earthquakes, they just give us the first sign of earthquake shaking taking place. It is much easier with volcanoes. We can predict volcanoes pretty well. So we can use specialised monitoring equipment, such as looking at the way the magma chamber is filling and the change in the bulge of the area of the landscape using tilt meters and strain meters and so on. We can also use seismometers to record minor earthquakes because they can indicate magma movement under the surface. We can finally analyse gas emissions to see if there's a change in the types of gases being emitted or the concentration in those gases and that may give us a clue as to a volcano erupting imminently. The reason volcanoes haven't actually caused many deaths in the last 100 years in many events is due to the fact that this high-tech approach of monitoring and predicting has been pretty successful. So some of the various methods we can use are GPS and satellite imagery to survey by volcanologists the land shape change where effectively they're looking at the deformation of the landscape. We can use thermal imaging to look at the heat and earthquake sensors and seismometers to look at remote sensing and vibration. And we can also, as we've already said, look at airborne and ground gases to see if there is any change. So volcanoes can be predicted. So now we sit in the middle of earthquakes and volcanoes. So they can be partially predicted. An earthquake-induced tsunami cannot really be predicted, although we can look at where the earthquake is to give us some help with that. Seismometers in the ocean and sensors in the ocean, in the deep ocean floor, can help locate where the earthquake has occurred, the focus of the earthquake. And monitoring equipment of the ocean can then help to detect a tsunami in the open sea. And that gives us time before the tsunami reaches a coastline. So it's difficult to prick to predict tsunamis but seismometers and ocean sensors can tell us if an earthquake has occurred in the ocean floor and the strength of it. We can then determine whether or not the tsunami risk is high, medium or low and we can then relay that to recording stations and ground stations who can look at the risk and warn people to evacuate coastal areas nearby. So now we're going to look at the first of our models or theories and the first one is the PAR model, the pressure and release model. And the key thing with the power model is it's looking at the vulnerability of a place and how that relates then to how it might cope in a disaster. So, the first thing to note is root causes. The first part of the vulnerability is the root causes of it. Underlying issues in a place like limited access to food, power, poverty, political issues and economic issues. All of these are root causes of vulnerability and they can therefore vulnerability can be high or low. Dynamic pressures. They are rapid change in a place, low capacity to keep up with that change. Things like rapid urbanisation in Haiti. Investment problems. Those dynamic pressures can therefore create high levels of vulnerability depending on the place. And finally, we can have unsafe conditions in a place. So physically where it's located due to plate tectonics, can be unsafe. Poor local economies, the physical environment itself, the way in which people react with each other, the social services of the area, and so on. All of these things can create unsafe conditions and therefore higher vulnerability levels. And Haiti, 2010, that earthquake event, and although there's been one in 2021, that earthquake event is a good example of where the power model fits into reality. So the root causes of the problems in Haiti were the fact that 1200 US dollars of GDP per capita exists, that's very low compared to the UK of 45,000. The 50% of the population is under 20 years old, so there is economic prob and social problems at the root of the area there as well, politically and economically. Dynamic pressures including lack of education and training and investment, 
rapid population change, rapid urbanization, all of these things cause instability and vulnerability in the area. And finally, the fact that Haiti does suffer from particularly Port-au-Prince, the city area, that suffers from 25% of poverty and extreme poverty before the 2010 event, which then rose to 50% after the 2010 event. And of course, 80% of Port-au-Prince's housing being unplanned. And unplanned housing, of course, is not very structurally well designed and therefore likely to collapse, causing further vulnerability. We then have the hazard management cycle. The hazard management cycle is effectively a four-stage process to look at the stages a nation, city or place might go through in responding to, recovering from, mitigating against and preparing for the next hazard. So response is all about responding to an event that has taken place, keeping people alive, emergency aid, food, shelter and water. Recovery is all about recovering from that actual event, rebuilding infrastructure, rebuilding the services of the nation or city, rehabilitating people who are injured physically and mentally so that they can take part in everyday life and the economy for the future. Mitigating against the next problem, acting to reduce the problem, land use zoning, moving people away from hazard risk areas, hazard resistant buildings, reducing collapsing buildings, improving infrastructure to make sure that the economic services of a place are strong. And finally, we can prepare. We can prepare for the next event by, for example, training people in what to do before, during and after a disaster such as an earthquake. We've seen this in Haiti, whereby there were earthquake drills in schools after the 2010 event. Resilience building in the community, prediction, warning, evacuation technology and systems. All of these things we looked at in prediction earlier for earthquakes, tsunamis and volcanoes are relevant here and they will manage the next hazard. Recovery stage, which was stage two, can be seen as returning to normal. But it's worth bearing in mind that some nations return to normal much quicker than others. And that's because of levels of investment, levels of development, resilience that already existed and experience. So governance, development, aid agencies and so on all play a key role in the recovery stage. Let's now look at the park disaster response model. So the park model essentially illustrates what could possibly happen if a natural hazard disaster took place in an area. And there are sort of three variations to the park model. A is the standard park model and then B and C on the diagram are the variations of it. And that's due to a number of different factors about the place itself and how the hazard has been managed. So let's start with Corvée, and this is the standard park disaster model. Corvée shows the sort of rapid but relative quality of life impact of a disaster. But it does steadily improve quite quickly, and it does return to normal within a few months to a year. So this would typically be your sort of higher developed nations. Curve B shows a rapid, rapidly uh, re improving and recovering country, a very highly developed nation. Less impact, less reconstruction needed or less time needed to, to conduct that reconstruction. Mitigation is useful. Preparedness is useful for the next hazard. And this would be your highest developed nations. Curve C is really the places that are lower income developing nations, such as Haiti of 2010. These are places where there is a vast impact over time on quality of life. Reconstruction phase is slow. It may take years to go back to normal or to try and get back to normal. But recovery is towards previously lower levels of quality of life. So it doesn't actually return to normal very quickly at all. And of course, Port-au-Prince, the capital of Haiti, 2010, fits profile C, of course, because even in 2015 and to some degree 2021 too, there is still recovery from that 2000 and, sorry, 2010 event. Of course, Haiti has also suffered from another major seven magnitude earthquake in 2021 in August. So therefore, Haiti isn't fully getting the chance to recover 
before another earthquake hits 10 years later. And lastly, now we're on to disaster modification. So this is all about the management and changing the way in which the disaster can affect an area. So we can modify the event itself, the earthquake event or the volcanic event or tsunami event itself. So we can use land use zoning. This is relatively cheap, requires strict law enforcement. And what it can do is prevent, for example, flood risk on a coastline by moving people off that coastline. It can prevent uh, lava flows damaging whole towns and villages and the people who live in them by moving the people away from that town and village and so on. We can build earthquake resistant buildings, which have deep foundations and reinforced steel and triangulation. These are sturdy, but they're very often very expensive and therefore are limited to higher income de developed nations. We can build tsunami defences, such as sea walls. They dramatically reduce damage, but they can be overtopped by the water, so it doesn't reduce, reduce the risk fully in flooding taking place or storm surges from the tsunami. And we can also have lava diversion, where we use volcanic bombs, lava bombs, to effectively change or alter the course of the lava if it was to flow down the hillside. But it only works on small volcanoes due to the vast nature of the landscape itself. We then have modifying the vulnerability of a place. So this is directly in relation to the power model, for example. So, high-tech monitoring. We said this earlier with predicting volcanoes. It's difficult, but it can be successful. It's costly and it doesn't actually prevent the damage. But what we can do is, again, land use zone, move people away from an area where we know or evacuate where we know a volcanic eruption is imminent or an earthquake is imminent. We can have community preparedness and education, practicing drills in schools, providing earthquake kits in case an earthquake does take place. This is all low cost, it can save lives, but it doesn't actually prevent the damage of the earthquake or volcano or tsunami itself. And finally, we can try to adapt. We can try to move to safer areas, we can try to save some properties and lives, but highly dense populated areas struggle with this because of the sheer amount of people that would need to adapt. Finally, modifying the loss. So this is your real sort of responses to your earthquake, tsunami or volcano. Short term aid, food, shelter, water. That reduces death tolls, keeps people alive, but it is high cost and relies on other governments from around the world to pitch in and help. Long term aid, reconstructing, improving resilience, but that's very costly as well. And insurance actually paying people for their losses, helping them to recover economically, get their businesses back up and running, for example. But this does not always save lives and is not always available. So I hope you found that session useful on some of those aspects of tectonic processes and hazards. Hopefully, you can use this now to help modify some of your particularly your six mark and 12 mark questions in the hazard area but also just make sure that you are with 12 mark questions constantly thinking about how you rate or look at most somewhat and least important in terms of for example the way in which we use the hazard management cycle or the power model or disaster modification.